welcome back. In this series, we're trying to build a one-bit computer out of vacuum tubes. <laughs> and saying it out loud sounds absolutely ridiculous because, uh, well, building a one-bit computer is something that nobody really does, and building a computer out of vacuum tubes is something that certainly nobody has done for a very long time. Uh, but we're having a ton of fun, and we're learning a ton about the very fundamentals of computing. And I've been dubbing this computer the UE14500 to pay homage to the Motorola chip that inspired the entire build, which was the MC14500. Uh, but we made some changes compared to that chip. Um, most notably, that chip only had a logic unit, and we did a massive redesign on that logic unit to turn it into a proper arithmetic logic unit. And in the previous episode, we actually built the arithmetic portion of our ALU. We built a full adder, but an ALU means that we also need a logic unit portion. So that's what I want to do today. We're going to figure out what our design for the logic unit is going to be. Then we're going to cut it up on the mill, get our PCB out, and hopefully test it out and maybe everything will work. I don't really know, uh, but that's what we're going to find out today. So let's hop over to the bench and get started. If we go back in time, all the way back to episode four, we built this proof of concept. And what we built here was uh, essentially very, very simple. It's just a logic unit here with a D flip flop over here and then some control down here. And despite having sat on my shelf for uh, <laughs> probably far too long, uh, it does still actually work. So if we set our data to one here and we set our load uh, address here as one zero zero, and then we hit the clock, we can see that it stores a one into there. And then if we set our data to zero and we hit our clock again, we load a zero into our result register. But essentially what I wanna to tackle today is the logic unit. And so if we go ahead and pull this out of the way, we can see here that this is the logic diagram for the proof of concept that we were just looking at. And so you can see all we have is a D flip flop over here and then four three input NOR gates that make up our logic unit. And of course there's an extra inverter on there and we're using both the non-inverted and inverted output of the D flip flop for our input into it. And so for the design for the full size tube computer that we're going to use actually makes use of this exact same uh, four three input NOR gate combination here. And so if we compare the logic units for the proof of concept and for the tube computer itself, we can see that they're pretty much identical. They both use four three input NOR gates. But if we take a look at the uh, logic unit on the right, which is one that we're actually going to use, there's a couple different changes. Uh, most notably, we can see that there is an additional three input OR gate as well as a NAND and an inverter to make an AND gate. And what these extra gates are doing is essentially just gating the output so that it's only outputting the result whenever we want it to. Now our input addressing works a little differently. With the proof of concept, we used the three bit address to essentially give us eight different operations. But on the full version, I can't actually do that because I only have a four bit instruction coming in in total. So I can only have three total instructions coming to the logic unit because all of the other instruction addresses have been filled up by other functions of the processor. And we aren't combining these in any way. It's just only one of these turns on at a time. And we can also see that uh, each one of these goes through the three input OR gate and that ultimately feeds into our NAND inverter making an AND gate. And so the logic unit will only be outputting when the result is a one and one of our three input instructions is on. So if we count the number of logic elements that we're going to need to build with tubes, we have one inverter on the data, we have four NOR gates, we have a NAND gate, and we have another inverter on that NAND gate to make an AND gate, which gives us seven logic elements. But seven is a weird number because if you remember, we're powering our tube heaters in modules of either two or four because they're being powered off of the 24 volt supply or the minus 12 volt supply. Uh, and seven doesn't really line up very well with that. Uh, but if we add one more tube as a cathode follower buffer, we can ensure that no matter what our logic unit is putting out, it's going to be nice and strong. And that puts us up to a nice round number of eight. And eight works out perfectly for powering our heaters. And so I've got a design that I'm pretty happy with. I'm gonna head out to the garage, cut it up on the mill right quick, build it up and then we'll give it a test.
All right, and here it is. And it looks awesome. Uh, just like the arithmetic unit, which I happen to have right here, and if you want to know more about this, check out the previous episode in the series. Uh, but just like the arithmetic unit, we uh, continued with this design theme of stuffing eight tubes on one board, and I just, I think it looks really cool. Uh, but also, it helps keep things very compact, and it means that I can stuff essentially one entire unit on a single board, uh, which is really quite nice. Now, all that's left is to test out this logic unit. Uh, but I'm, I'm fairly confident that it'll work fine because, well, we tested out essentially the same thing on our proof of concept uh, many, many moons ago. And if we think back to that proof of concept, we actually had one major problem that we came across, and that was actually not with the logic unit itself, but with how the logic unit interacted with the D flip-flop. So if we take a look at the logic diagram for the proof of concept that we built earlier again, we can see that it's using the data as an input and it's using the result register itself as an input. And so that means that the output of the logic unit is contingent on what is stored in the result register. But if we're doing, for example, an exclusive OR operation or an exclusive NOR operation, whenever the result register changes, it's going to change what the output of the logic unit is. Uh, so for example, if the logic unit is outputting a one and it goes to store that one in the result register, well then now the result register has a one, which means that the logic unit is going to want to be outputting a zero, which is going to try and store a zero back into the result register, which uh, then means that the logic unit is receiving a zero from the result register, which is going to make it want to output a one. So it's going to try and put that one back into the result register. Well, I mean, you can see where this is going. Uh, we, we ended up with a problem of timing and loops. Uh, and so this type of D flip-flop did not work for our uh, proof of concept. And so this interaction of the logic unit with the result register is by far the most critical part of the entire build. Every other aspect, I can kind of fudge the timing. But the logic unit, and well, ultimately the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit, needs to interact with the result register perfectly. So we need the result register to transition its state on the falling edge of the clock. So that way, by the time the ALU updates, the D flip-flop is no longer caring about what the input is, and it's already locked in its state. So let's take a look at the types of D flip-flops that we can build. The first one is by far the simplest D flip-flop that you can build. It's just four logic gates, but if the data changes while the clock pulse is high, the output changes as well. And so while it works great for essentially creating a gated input for an SR flip-flop, which is what we're seeing on the far right here, uh, it, it has this runaway problem where you can just oscillate like crazy. Now with some Googling, there is a better solution for a D flip-flop that uses uh, two more logic gates. We can see that's this one over here on the right. And it has a very interesting combination of how the logic moves throughout it. But essentially on the far right, you can see we still have our basic SR flip-flop. And then these four uh, NOR gates on the left act as a way to gate it. And this this actually works very, very well for 90% of the D flip-flops that we need to use. So for example, this is what we're using for the instruction register. We have uh, four of these six NOR gate D flip-flops. And this was even the design that we used on our proof of concept here. But as we saw on the proof of concept, it wasn't quite right. We were getting some timing issues and I kind of bodged my way through a fix of it by adding in some desensitizing capacitors and just kind of fudging my way through it. Uh, but I don't think that's going to work so well if we get to any clock speeds that are higher than me just very slowly pushing the button. And so we need a proper D flip-flop design. And that's what this design here on the bottom is. You can see that it's actually identical to the very first D flip-flop that we took a look at. There's just two of of them, one of them feeding the other. And the clock signal pulses are opposite. So the small D flip-flop on the left uses an inverted clock signal coming in, and then its output goes into the data of the D flip-flop on the right, and the D flip-flop on the right gets the regular clock pulse signal. And this is uh, called a master-slave or a uh, primary-secondary D flip-flop, and it seems to be a fairly common design. And I think this is going to work perfectly for us. But there's only one way to find out, and that's to actually cut out a PCB for this, build it up, 
and then give it a test. All right, I've got the result register all built up and it's uh, sitting right here. It's this little board with uh, eight tubes on it. I'm really liking this theme of having eight tubes on a single board. Uh, although I did run into a couple of problems. Uh, the first was that I didn't notice it, but uh, one of the tubes that I put in was this one right here. Um, and the getter is just pretty much non-existent on it. And uh, if I looked really closely on it, there's a small crack on the base. And so I think this tube just went to air. And then when I powered it up, the filament popped, which meant that there was an entire bank of tubes that the filaments weren't warming up on uh, because I run all the filaments in series. And then after I placed the broken tube, this thing still wasn't working correctly. And uh, after checking a couple of the voltages, uh, the output of one tube was just stuck at 17 volts, which didn't really make a whole lot of sense. But when I pulled that tube out and replaced it with a different one, it all kind of came back into line. And so this was the tube that's in question. Um, and if we look at the glass on it, we can see that this tube is definitely tired. It's had a lot of hard emission in its life. Uh, the glass is darkening where there are openings in the plate um, and presumably electrons are striking the glass. But uh, this, having one that the filament worked on but the emission was terrible is an interesting problem. And I think I'm gonna need to build a tester or something to uh, check this for the low voltages that I'm running at. All right, now as for what I've got set up here, we've got the result register on the right here. We've got the logic unit on the left here. And then in the center on the breadboard here, we have an inverter set up. And uh, the reason that we have an inverter is because the result register, our uh, D flip-flop actually needs an inverter as well as eight NOR gates. And I was able to fit eight NOR gates on one board, uh, but the inverter is gonna need to be offloaded to a different part of the processor. Now the purple and blue wire here are going to be the output Output and inverted output of our result register and those are being fed into the logic unit back here and then the green wire coming out of the logic unit here is its output which is then being fed into an input of the result register over here so we can see that we've got that kind of circular hookup that could potentially cause runaway oscillations then the brown white and orange wires here are our three selection bits um, this is going to tell us whether we're doing an exclusive or a NAND or an OR. And then I have a little toggle switch here to show whether I've got the data on or off. And then because absolutely nothing is buffered, uh, I've, I'm just probing the outputs on the oscilloscope here just so that we can see what's going on without actually loading them down with some LED indicators. And then on the scope here, we have two traces. We've got a purple trace and a yellow trace. And the yellow trace is going to be the output from our logic unit. And the purple trace is what is stored in our result register. All right, so if we want to store a one into our result register, we can do an or operation and set our data to one because one or with, well, whatever's in there is going to be a one. So we've got our data set to one. That's what our little red LED here is showing. Uh, and the or operation, I believe, is going to be the white wire here. So we'll go ahead and pull that high. Uh, yeah, and we can see that um, the yellow trace jumped up to a high logic level here, uh, and that means that our logic unit is outputting a one. Now, if I turn the data off, that should jump back down. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so we jump that back up, but our result register is still storing a zero. I need to hit the clock. So if I hit the clock, we should see the result register jump up as well. Yeah, there we go. And uh, the result register jumped up when I released the button. So it's working on the falling edge. That's awesome. So our logic unit seems to be working correctly and our result register seems to be storing data correctly. But the uh, big one is the exclusive or operation because whatever we store into the result register is going to change what the logic unit is outputting. So if the logic unit is outputting a one, as soon as that one is stored in the result register, the logic unit is then going to be outputting a zero. And that's where we can get our timing and our oscillation problems. So let's select exclusive or here. That's going to be the brown wire here. All right, so we can see that our result register, the purple trace here, is still storing a one, and that's from what we saved from the previous OR operation. Uh, and then our logic unit is now outputting a zero, and that's because it's doing an exclusive OR of one and one. So when I hit the clock, we should see the result register drop down. But when the result register drops down, now we're doing an exclusive OR operation of zero and one, which means that the output is going to be one. So simultaneously, we should see the logic unit jump up to a high logic level. 
So uh, let's uh, let's give that a shot. Yeah, there we go. All right, so our result register is now storing a zero and our logic unit is outputting a one. So if I hit the clock again, we should store a one into the result register and then we have one and one exclusive ORD, which means that our output should be zero. So we should see the purple go up and simultaneously the yellow come down. Let's give that a shot. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there it goes. Uh, it seems really ridiculous for me to be super excited about just watching these two lines flip uh, places, but it took a phenomenal amount of work to get here, and it's a really delicately balanced system, but <laughs> it's working really well. Uh, so I can just flip back and forth between the two. How awesome is that? <laughs> that is very, very cool. So our result register and our logic unit are working together perfectly. This was the most terrifying part of the entire processor because if this could not be done correctly, the entire architecture is then broken. Uh, but it looks like we're safe for now, which means I'm very rapidly approaching a point of uh, draw the rest of the owl. So I'm gonna hop back onto the computer, continue designing up boards, continue cutting them out, and I've got a lot of soldering ahead of me. But I want to thank you guys so much for watching and joining me on this journey. We're getting real close and I'm getting real excited. So I hope you guys stick around to see how this insane processor project is going to come to fruition. But in the meantime, I've still got a lot of work to do. So I'm going to hop to it and I hope to see you guys in the next episode.